Hey guys, back again. This week we're talking about toxicology. This is one of my favorite subjects. I always thought it'd be cool to work part-time at Pet Poison Helpline, just, you know, learn a little bit. Um, but it's just so neat how all these normal things in our lives can cause such bad things for our pets. And then also like the client education part of it, like how many people just don't know. They're like, oh yeah, uh, Rufus was so good last night. I gave him a little piece of my chocolate. You're like, whoa, wait, what? <laughs> but um, anyways, we'll get into the questions. So number one is what's the definition and difference between pharmacology and toxicology? They're very similar where pharmacology is the study of how a chemical is absorbed, distributed, and excreted. Um, technically, you just do a little word change in that um, toxicology is the study of how poisons are absorbed, distributed, and excreted. Number two is what's the most common route of toxin exposure is orally and definitely by dogs. You know, they eat everything. I have a Labrador. I know. <laughs> um, so number three, what are the most important questions to assess toxin exposure uh, or to assess a toxin exposure situation? So we need to know the signalment. Is it um, a breed specific thing? Is it like a border collie that a ivermectin? Um, size and weight makes a difference. So is it like a Irish wolfhound that ate a little square of chocolate or is it a little two pound chihuahua that ate a square of chocolate? Um, the time exposed is really important. Has this toxin already been in the pet's body for six hours? Did it just happen? Um, vomiting, has it been vomiting already? Because obviously if it's already vomiting, we're not going to induce vomiting again. Um, has the owner taken any steps? Have they given any medications? Uh, what route is the toxin absorbed? So was it in the eye? Was it inhaled? Was it in the skin? Did they actually eat it? Um, what's the type of toxin and the amount ingested? Um, hopefully the owner has a packaging of whatever they ingested. This is super important in rodenticides, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but the packaging is really important to know all the ingredients because maybe it's not just xylitol and the sugar-free gum, but you know, maybe it has some other kind of um, substance in it that can harm our pet. And then um, what's the condition of the pet? Like, are they having seizures? Are they lateral? Um, are they bright and alert? That can make a difference in our diagnosis as well. So number four, what dose of hydrogen peroxide is appropriate to induce emesis? It is one teaspoon per five pounds, which we know a teaspoon is five ml. So we can also call that one milliliter per pound. And our maximum dose is written as 50 milliliters per dog, but also thinking you should only dose it twice because a little tiny 10 pound thing shouldn't have 50 cc's of um, hydrogen peroxide. Uh, but just knowing that after two doses, if it still hasn't done the trick, they just need to come in. But not that it's bad to recommend amesis over the phone because, you know, what if they live an hour away? You know, I work in a rural practice where some of my clients come from an hour and a half, maybe two hours away. So we don't want that toxin to be in their body for that long while they're trying to get to us. So it's okay for them to do that at home. Um, the quicker we can get it out of the system, the better. When is amesis contraindicated? So if a dog is debilitated and doesn't, like say, doesn't have a swallow reflex, just like when we're extubating a surgery patient, you don't want to induce vomiting there. Um, first of all, they may not vomit. And second of all, if they do, they might aspirate. Um, and like a recumbent dog or a seizing dog, those are not dogs in good condition to vomit. Also, if they're already vomiting, then we don't want to induce vomiting because they're already doing it. And then if it's a caustic agent, so um, another thing we'll talk about is one of the rodenticides that's out there, I don't think it's much on the shelf anymore, but it can still be found, can cause a toxic gas when they when it mixes with stomach acid. So when they vomit, you can inhale it, um, the parents can inhale it. So it's really important to know what you're dealing with before you induce vomiting. Number six, what do we mean when we mention good nursing care? So the point of this is knowing that some of these toxins we can't do a whole lot about, so it's important to keep the patient comfortable. Um, are they recumbent? If they are, they need to be rotated so we prevent decubital ulcers or bed sores. Um, 
is their mouth really dry? Are they thirsty? Should we like wet them up a little bit? Are they cold? Should we make sure that they have a nice warm blanket? Do they have a nice soft bed? Are they seizing and maybe need some blankets wrapped around them so they don't hit their head? You know, just really good nursing care um, is super important to these guys too. What do you do in a case of ocular exposure? We're going to flush for 20 to 30 minutes. We're always going to start with just straight water. It could be tap water. doesn't matter. Um, we don't know what the toxin is. Does the toxin have some kind of weird binding with salt so that a sodium chloride or saline would be a bad rinse? Just always start with tap water until you know what we're dealing with. Usually saline is okay, but it's always safe to make sure first. For dermal exposure, we're going to bathe with a... A uh, mild detergent, Dawn is always a really good choice. I know in my hospital, we always have Dawn on hand. And also remembering when you're bathing these guys, keep in track of their temperature because hypothermia can be hard to battle with those, age, with those patients. Uh, number eight, how long after ingestion do we not induce amnesis? So not that it's not contraindicated, but after one to three hours, that drug is probably already absorbed, drug or whatever toxin, and you're just making the patient uncomfortable by vomiting. Like it doesn't need to. It's already too late. Sorry. Um, number nine, what's the preferred emetic drug in canine? So we know that we can use hydrogen peroxide, but preferably we like apomorphine. So there's a couple different ways that you can use it. You can use a capsule in the eye, and when they start vomiting, you can rinse it. So that's how you get to your desired effective dose. Um, I haven't seen that used in a really long time. I know some places used to actually, I mean, Wedgwood or Roadrunner might still um, make like an eye drop. It's already prepared where you put an eye drop on their eye and they start vomiting. Um, but more popularly, apomorphine comes in an injectable form. So we just injected IV. And then remembering if you give it IM or sub-Q, they usually don't vomit off of it. So it's really important to get an IV. And cats... That's another story. So apomorphine is not recommended. And um, more popular, we talk about doing xylazine to make them throw up. But in my experience, it doesn't really work very well either. Um, kind of the newer practice is to use dexmedetomidine, so our dexdomator. And that's kind of another joke. It's, it's like an ongoing thing. We all know that felines don't vomit very well. It's really hard to get them to. And if you give them a dextomator dose, they'll just get sedated. If you're actually sedating them for a procedure, they'll vomit every time. It's the running joke, and it's really true. <laughs> um, number 10, what does activated charcoal do? It binds toxins and facilitates excretion. Number 11, there are two types of activated charcoal. What are they, and how do they differ? So our one activated charcoal is just kind of a straightforward charcoal. And then our other one is the red label and it contains sorbitol, which is a cathartic. How I like to explain to people is that it makes the bowels go from zero to 60 in like very few seconds. Um, and a little story from experience, we had a, we had a client that wasn't being very nice and you know, you always want to get back at them. And we had a a doctor that was just fed up with him. So we gave the dog the cathartic and sent the dog home so it would explode in the car. Well, didn't quite make it and exploded in the doctor's office instead <laughs> on the way out. Um, anyways, and that's always a warning that I give to my kennel staff too is, you know, this is a cathartic. The, the purpose is to bind as much as it can and get it out as quickly as possible. So make sure that they're getting walked frequently when they have that sorbitol or else you're in for a mess, <laughs> a dark black mess too. So number 12, activated charcoal is contraindicated in some substances, name a few. So ethylene glycol does not bind, xylitol does not bind, inorganic salts and metals do not bind. Um, fun thing is metals actually bind to EDTA, our chelating agent that we use to bind calcium for our anticoagulants and our blood samples for hematology. See, I'm telling you, everything always circles back. Number 14, there usually isn't like antidotes to inhibit toxins. Um, I mean, there are for some, but usually we are treating with supportive care. And then what do we mean by this? So we're monitoring the patient 
We are giving the patient fluids. We're trying to diurese any, any of those toxins or dilute them. Drug therapy, so maybe anti-seizure medications or um, coagulation medications. Um, nutrition, so maybe they can't eat and we got to do a feeding tube of some sort because the proteins are really important in helping carry drugs and getting them out of the system and also just overall health uh, temperature. So some of these like uh, tremory patients can get hyperthermic, so keeping them cool or keeping our hypothermic patients warm. So not necessarily that there's like, this is the one thing that fixes the patient after a toxicology or after a toxin is ingested. Really, we're kind of doing a combination of things to treat what's happening in the body because we're treating the patient, not the poison, right? Number 15, what topical parasite medication is safe for dogs but toxic in cats? And that will be our pyrethrin. Um, there's other products out there that flea and tick medications that don't have pyrethrin anymore, but there's still some out there, like especially our over-the-counter ones at like Walmart will have it. And also knowing that it's it's derived from a chrysanthemum and you can find at the feed store some fly sprays that are um, chrysanthemum based. So being cautious of those around cats as well. And the main symptom when a cat's been exposed is tremors and seizure-like activity. There's some of the videos that we posted, you can take a look, but um, I come from Florida, of course, we have a lot of parasites, and that's one thing that, you know, we would see people would try to be cheap and split their large dog doses and not realize that it's said for dogs only, and then they come in, you bathe them, and whatnot. Number 16, what does organophosphates do when ingested? It inhibits acetylcholinerase. So there's a little chart in your lecture that shows what that acetylcholine does to the body, so it inhibits quite a bit. So CNS stuff, lacrimation, um, you'll see a lot of salivation. And knowing that you'll learn more of this in pharmacy, toxicology does come back up. But anticholinergic usually treats those symptoms. What is a toxic element in chocolate? So theobromine is the main one, but caffeine as well. And then what type of chocolate is most potent? So either like a dark chocolate that's like a high percentage of cacao or unsweetened baking chocolate is very toxic, very high percentage of theobromine. What is LD50? So LD50 is the amount of toxin that it takes to kill half of the population that ingested it. So it's also called median lethal dose. Number 19. What are some toxic effects of onions, thinking back to hematology? So it can cause hemolysis and Heinz bodies, which I, I remember learning when I was in school and then going back and seeing in the lecture like where they used to put onion in baby food where, I mean, we can eat an onion, but it's going to take quite a few onions for you know our adult human bodies to process. But these little babies that you know their immune system isn't very well, they're not fully developed, and then now we're giving them onions that cause Heinz bodies and hemolysis. Like that was an issue at some point, which was always terrifying to me. It's scary. It's just like something small like baby food. Number 20, what happens when Gorilla Glue is ingested? So this one I kind of threw in. I think there's a small mention, but we don't talk about it much. Um, this is another from my experience. So Gorilla Glue actually swells. So even if they eat like a, a little bit of it, it turns into like a big bowling ball. And it actually is like radio opaque and you can see it on x-ray. And not technically a whole lot of toxic signs from it, but it can't pass or dissolve. So it has to be surgically removed. Number 21, what blood chemistries are we worried about when xylitol is ingested? So when you see the word xylitol, always think glucose because it, in, it takes the place of glucose in the body. So the glucose levels just go... They just plummet, right? Um, so they will be hypoglycemic. Number 22, what is the year of the penny important when it comes to ingestion? So 1983. And before 1983, pennies were made of zinc instead of copper. And zinc causes hemolysis. So that's important to know when you have coin ingestion. Which is dumb, right? Like there's dogs out there that eat coins. <laughs> Number 23, what are three categories of rodenticides? 
name them and describe them. So I'm going to keep this basic for time purposes, but bromethylin is our C and S rat poison where they're seizing. And if you catch it and decan decontaminate, usually you can be on the safe side. However, if they're already having seizures or as soon as you start seeing those CNS signs, it's a very poor prognosis and they don't usually make it any longer than 24 hours after ingestion. Anticoagulants, another one. Our anticoagulant rodenticides inhibit vitamin K. And we learned in our earlier lectures that that's part of our clotting cascade. Um, so they can be okay, actually, as long as you start supplementing their vitamin K right away and getting... Um, like a baseline hematocrit and see how much blood they've lost. They might need a transfusion and they might need um, either whole blood for volume or they might need some plasma for some clotting factors. And of course, the vitamin K supplement. They usually have a pretty good prognosis if you catch it on time. Cholecalciferol is another one. You don't really see around a whole lot, but it is still out there. It's a vitamin D3 inhibitor, so it increases your blood calcium, which leads to renal failure. So our point for that is lots of fluids and lots of diuretic. So you're getting the fluids to flush them out and getting the diuretic to get it all out. I'll be giving the kidney some support. Then the last question is, what resources can owners use to get information after a suspected toxin has been ingested? Ingested, sorry. Because we know, like, we don't know everything. We try to know as much as we can, but there's even some stuff that the books just can't tell us. So Pet Poison Helpline or the ASPCA Poison Control, um, those are really important resources. I recommend you have stickers around your hospital. So if somebody calls and says, my dog ate borax, and you're like, whoa, I have no idea call poison control. And it's really easy. They're super nice to talk to. They give you a case number. So as soon as the owners are done talking to them, they give you a case number and give you a treatment plan. So it takes all the work out of it. Um, and the same thing, um, depending on your hospital, sometimes you can have an account with them and you can call and they actually give you information. That way, you know, if the owners are in the car and they don't have time to call, you can call and have a plan before the dog arrives. That's about it. Um, Keep all these as study because you're going to go over some of this stuff again next semester in pharmacology. Um, again, tox is so cool. There's so many cool things. Um, and then later on, we'll talk about all of our projects. And since I didn't cover all of the toxins you need to know about in the homework, um, make sure that you look at everyone's projects to um, have, us, have us study for the test, okay? If you have any questions, let me know. Bye.